Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Passionately Wrong podcast. I'm James Bellerjo, and I'm here with my friend and co-host, Randy Thurls. Today, we want to talk with you about possessions, or more colloquially, stuff. What do people have? Why do they have it? What has our relationship with our possessions evolved over time and why? And we're not exactly sure where we're going this one. I have an intuition that the last three generations have seen an explosion in material wealth and material goods, partly by virtue of becoming wealthier, but also by virtue of just the ease with which we can now manufacture and ship stuff all over the world. And it probably has had a pretty significant impact on our relationship with things. But maybe we start with Randy and I were talking before we started recording today about uh, when I said, uh, suggested the topic, he said, hey, do you remember that comedy routine by George Carlin uh, where he did a whole riff on stuff? And I did remember it and I looked it up and it looked like he first did that routine in 1986, which was, of course, the year we graduated from high school and went year railing. And do you remember, Randy, what we had with us? First of all, just as teenagers at that time, high schoolers, what we would have had in our rooms and spent time with every day. And then we'll get into what we brought with us, your railing, and then go on from there. But how's your memory like? I remember we would have had those of us who had access to a computer somewhere, right? So you, that was a prized possession. And then you would have had some discs. Of course, there would have been your Walkman and whatever cassette tapes you had, that would have been a big deal. Your school work and books you know, and then your clothes. But what else would a teenager have had in the eighties that they would have counted amongst their valuable stuff and possessions? A Walkman probably. Yeah. That Walkman was a big deal. Oh, I had a bunch of books. Like I had a job in McDonald's and I spent every dime I earned there at a bookstore called the Forbidden Planet in London that has now become a chain across Britain. And, uh, and it's five times bigger than it ever was when I went there, but I bought so many books there. I had so many books. My dad, at one point when I was in the army said, Hey, I have all your stuff in the basement. When are you going to come get it? When I was like 28 or something like that, I had comics and books and all this game stuff and everything like that. Computer, I, you know, my dad was in the computer industry. We had one, one computer for the family that we shared, um, but I didn't have my own computer. I know. Robert Arzanetti, who may actually be a guest here, he had his own, I remember he had his own little Apple computer and he would be playing different games on it and stuff. I, he had his own room. I remember that. Yeah. I think it was clothes, mostly bought by my parents and, uh, my books and, uh, I had a, I think I had a Walkman. I had a TV in my room, but it was old TV. I remember watching the, the um, shuttle explode, the Challenger explode on my TV the day it happened. I came back from school. Because we're six, six, five, six hours ahead, whatever. And so it was after school and I remember watching it explode. Um, um, two things in that, what you just said, Randy, there are, of course, when you're a teenager or a young adult, you might've been working, but you don't have as much money, relatively speaking, uh, and you're doing other things. So the possessions you have at that age are precious and they're a reflection of what's interesting to you. So you've got your Walkman and your music, you've got your books. Very important I think both of us. Reminds me of a quote, I think it was from Erasmus of Rotterdam 50 years ago, who said, when I have a little money, I buy books. And if I have any extra money, I buy food. And yeah, they're, they're an important part. And it was a big deal uh, to have access to books. So that's going to definitely be one of those things, both music and books that were so important to us that I think people's relationship with has changed. But the second thing I wanted to mention was, of course, your parents are the ones who are providing for your material needs as you are a child and growing up. So they'll also be responsible for having probably paid for directly or indirectly a lot of one's books or music or entertainment, even as a high schooler and certainly your clothes and the other stuff in the house for many people. Anyway, I know some parents start to put their kids on the allowance, but they now, as of this age, you're going to be responsible for buying your clothes and your entertainment, which also works as a way to get people to start thinking about that stuff costs money. Let's talk then about when did you start to feel like you had stuff? You talked about your dad having boxes of your stuff in the basement and calling you up. When did you start to feel like you had stuff that was your responsibility that you carted around with you? I yeah, we talked about we went to Euro Rally where we had a big heavy backpack for a month, you and I and three other guys. Then we went to college and whatever we brought to college, which was maybe two suitcases worth of stuff. And I threw some clothes, I threw some of my favorite books in there. And then maybe I acquired some stuff in college. I don't know. 
But I joined the army a year. I started, I did college for a year and then I joined the army. In the army, you show up with one change of clothes, the clothes on your back, that all gets bagged away. And then you're issued you uniforms, including underwear, t-shirt, socks, boots. And that's what you wear all through, for some people, four or five months of basic training and, uh, and uh, your initial training in your profession, which can last up to a year in some cases. And so I did four and a half months of basic training and advanced infantry training. And, uh, and I did, that's all I wore. I had, I still had, I think I was allowed to get off post one for one pass during that whole time. And, and they let me have my civilian clothes back, I think for that time, or I have to wear my uniform. I can't remember. And I didn't even know, I didn't even know how the bases worked. I was like, so I just show ID card to get on the base. And like, what do you mean? I mean this is before 9-11, obviously. This is in the early 90s. And a lot of our bases were open to the public. You could drive. Some of them had highways going through them. Inter, inter, not interstate highways, but local highways. And Fort Bragg is, had two highways that were on the same road. They went straight through the middle of the base. And when the 9-11 happened and they started putting fences around and guards and stuff on all the bases, they actually had to put the fences around. Initially, they put the fences on either side of the highway so they could, people could still use it. And now then they did a roundabout, but it took 10 years to get that up. So it was kind of, it was really kind of nuts. But this all to say that when I first came, I was, I didn't get stuff till I got married, to tell you the truth, because I never had a house to myself until I got, I bought a house right before I got married, before I met the girl I married the first time, my first marriage. I bought a house because I was like, I should invest some of this stuff. I was 31. Before that, I was a roommate in an apartment. And usually the roommate had the apartment and needed a roommate. It was a military friend of mine or something. And I stayed with them. But I moved around the military every two or three years. And then I'd have to find a new roommate in a new apartment. And I always had like, I didn't even have a bed most of the time. I just slept on the floor in a, what we call a poncho liner. And I had two army duffel bags full of my military clothes and one a duffel bag full of my civilian clothes. And that's how I'd move into people's houses. And they're like, that's it. I was like, that's it. And then I wouldn't get a bookcase. I'd have a storage. I had a storage where I put my books that I actually started buying and collecting after I, my parents still had mine. But for 10, 15, 12 years, I was a, a backpack man, for the lack of a better word. This raises two important considerations that will affect how one develops a relationship with stuff, Randy, and in general, that'll inform people's relationship with stuff. And they are stuff be the place. You can't accumulate stuff if you have nowhere to put it. And a home is an obvious, uh, I would say, benefit for various reasons, but it's also things have a tendency of accumulating when you have space to put them in. And so having the space to put stuff is a really, really important factor to determine whether or not you're going to accumulate stuff. And the second thing, which is going to be, will make sense to many of our listeners and watchers, which is depending on how itinerant your lifestyle is, you are going to have more or less attachment to things. We went to school overseas and then came back to the U.S. for the beginning of college or then other things. Of course, you're going to bring less with you on that plane flight over to start school than someone whose parents are dropping them off with a minivan full of the stuff out of their high school or their homeroom. So we just didn't, we didn't bring as much things with us to begin with. And it's more than just that. It's more than just, I had to fly to get to my first university like you did. It's that our families also moved around and there's something about moving from place to place that makes you at least think about. What stuff do I pack up and bring with me each time? There's a friction and a cost and a burden associated with carting stuff from place to place. In fact, what I observed over the years, you know, my family moved a bunch of times like yours did and uh, many of our listeners. Sometimes stuff got left in storage on an early move and it doesn't get touched again for decades. You don't think of it. You don't go back to it and say, oh, I, you know, that couch I put into storage in that barn in upstate New York. My parents have things that they put into storage before we moved to Saudi Arabia in the seventies. And then some of it was still there 40 years later, just, and it's a little bit like a time capsule, but it shows to me, okay, moving is one factor and how much you move as you are living your life. And then do you have a place that you feel like you can comfortably put stuff in and leave it there at a home, for example, when you bought your house, then in your thirties, Randy, 
you said it was an investment property. Were you living in the house uh, that you bought? So I moved in there, but more, uh, being a Green Beret, I was deployed six, nine months out uh -huh. of here. It was basically a place, and instead of, it, it was a little bit more expensive storage. There you go. And then I did finally buy a bed, but it was, but the thing was, it was also very difficult to, you know, I still moved every two or three years and the army pays for the move, but I was just as happy throwing three duffel bags. I think when I moved that first time after I had the house, when I finally moved, I, my move was to Columbia where I had to live in an apartment in this capital because you did, there's no houses in the, where I need, close to where I needed to work at the embassy. So I got it was a nice size apartment, but it was apartment, which means, and also the washing and dryer machines work differently there and they're a lot smaller in order to fit in where they need to go and all this stuff. And you never know what kind of apartment you're going to get. So if you ship something down there, you never know if it's going to fit. So I just got rid of everything and started over. And all I did was ship over my books. I've tried, I shipped over five boxes of books, two boxes of clothes, and I came with two suitcases and I started over. And then when I moved back from Columbia, same thing. I got rid of everything. I didn't have anything. It actually, the places I rented came furnished, so it was pretty easy. Um, but And then I just shipped all my books and my clothes back. And then I bought another house in Florida. Three years later, I moved to Italy, sold everything, Start moved to Italy, started over. And then I moved to Romania with three bags, three duffel bags again. So I haven't been much of an acquirer. Most of the stuff I acquired by the end of my military career was military junk. A lot of it, half of it, which I had to turn in uh, when I left, I had to turn in all my equipment. I had, I had backpacks and magazines for 18 different kinds of weapons and th things to hold the magazines and the weapons and uh, just old weather gear and stuff like that. I got to keep all the uniforms, but I had 30 years worth of, I had literally like 30 uniforms, 10 pairs of boots. And all this stuff that I got to keep, some of which didn't fit me by the time I finished my career either, by the way. And uh, some of it, which was well used and had holes in it, was not even really serviceable. I have those. I wanted to give them my opportunity, my kids to have those. So I brought them back and said, hey, you guys want them? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I left them in my dad's garage and they never came and got them. My dad's like, what are you going to do with this stuff? So it's funny. I also, uh, and you, I am guessing, Randy, are going to be on the extreme low end of accumulation of stuff over the course of. 50 some years of life based on the good reason for it. Lived a lifestyle and we're working in a profession that your employer basically gave you your stuff and you moved around so much. There was no other opportunity to, to really accumulate stuff. The fact that you held on to your books is an interesting thing. And one I'm going to come back to the power of tend to mentality in a way, uh, but also just the things that we choose to hold on to. I also accumulated my work uniform and work boots and work accoutrement. It was a suit and shirts and ties and a briefcase, uh, but I got closets full of them now. And I'm in early retirement thinking, okay, what am I going to do with all these suits and ties? And I'd be happy to give them back if somebody would take them. But uh, the gears so, are a little expensive than mine, probably. Uh, I wrote an article recently about cleaning up one of the places that we had kept stuff, our house in Switzerland. And we moved several times different countries and within countries, not as much as you. And we stayed oh, for several years in each place. And it was always depressing to me to see both how quickly we reaccumulated stuff in a new place. Oh, you need a garlic press and you need a blender. And <laughs> so you get the thing. And then when you move, you're like, why don't we have this stupid thing? We have to use the garlic press ever. Well, I'm sure we did, but whatever, you know, pick the thing that you rarely use, but somehow thought you needed. And then when you move, you're like, okay, I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm not going to buy another one. And I caught it up or added up the amount of money that we had spent on CDs and DVDs and books and kitchen stuff. And it's a, it was a staggering amount of money every time. And it seemed like a, it's an opportunity cost for sure. And it certainly doing this moving several times and buying things has made me question the, our relationship with stuff and really thinking about what's valuable and what's going to have an impact on you over time. And at least in my case, it is a tiny percentage of all the things that uh, we ended up accumulating that turned out to be of enduring value. And it made me flirt a little bit with the idea of minimalism. These people who talk about, I don't need more than these seven things. I got a cup and a spoon and I, you know, uh, you probably, it sounded like you were actually living unintentionally a minimalist lifestyle. You had to decide many times, well, what do I need to have with me? 
in my backpack, for example, what did you have in there? You had food and clothes and some equipment and maybe a book. Not much else, right? You had just the stuff that was necessary to live. That's probably too extreme for most people. But have you ever thought about what it is that are amongst your most treasured possessions? I notice you upgraded your office and now have a lovely bookshelf behind you. It looks really nice. Uh, and for people who are just listening, uh, there's a, a four level, five level bookcase with uh, some books nicely commonly displayed in the middle. And I assume these are books that you've edited or written, Randy, for you and your clients. Tell us a little bit about what you have behind you and what that tells us about the topic of today. Actually, half of them to, are my wives. Most of my, I, when I came, I, I left Italy. I shipped back all my books to my dad's house because I didn't know where I was going to end up. And I ended up going to Romania and staying there. And I had brought in three books that I love, my three favorite books or something like that. But also with the Kindle in what it was called, 2010 or whatever, it became really easy to transport. I like a book, but it just became easy to transport all. I actually ended up buying all my books again on Kindle, though some of my favorite books aren't available on Kindle. The authors passed away. Whoever's in charge of getting their royalties decided not to put them on uh, digital and or didn't know or whatever. And so they're not available in there. And, and so I'm glad I still have them. My dad probably isn't very appreciative, but he has seven or eight boxes of books in his above his garage that are mine. So these are, yes, a lot of these books that I have right now are books that uh, helped either wrote, ghost wrote or edited, and they were kind enough to send me a copy, a signed copy and stuff like that. So a lot of my books are that are up there are that, or they're writing books that I learned better, how to write better or edit. And then my wife was kind enough to put her books up there so, so it wouldn't look too sparse. But yeah, I, you know, and so I'll give you one example. I had, I was probably about 30. And I just finished the Greenbury medical course in San Antonio, which I had spent a year there doing the medical course. And I'd driven from Fort Bragg, North Carolina to San Antonio with three bags, three duffel bags, as we explained, and a box of books probably in the back of my pickup truck. And then uh, on the, when I finished the year training there, I drove to, I went, I drove to Orlando and did a marathon, did the Disney marathon, which I highly recommend. It's very entertaining. And that was in January. And then I was driving up to Fort Bragg and there was an ice storm. And I, was, and I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go to Charleston. So I went to Charleston. They have an Air Force base there. Well, I went in there. I was like, hey, I want to fly to Australia. How do I do that for free? And they're like, yes, uh, we're going to plane leave tomorrow for San Antonio. And then we have another one leaving for California the next day. And then two days later, we have one leaving for Hawaii. And then we have another one leaving for Australia. And I had three months off. I was like, I'll do it. Uh, can I leave my car parked in the base parking lot out there? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay. So I took my three duffel bags. Thank God I only had three. Put them all in the cab. And then I went to the PX and bought a big backpack and took what I wanted to bring. To not even a big backpack, a small backpack. And I got on a plane and I went to Australia for two months. And, uh, and then I came back and my car was still there with all my stuff in it. And then I drove to the base went and signed it and went back to work. So, but once again, the minimalist is sometimes I've been pretty minimal. That's very true. And, and also when the war on terror started in Afghanistan and Iraq, everything I would deploy for nine to 15 months at a time. And I'd have to figure out, I had all my military gear. What civilian gear am I going to bring? And so and what room do I have? And in the beginning, in the 2002, 2003, before Kindle, it was tough because I wanted to bring books. The great thing about the military bases is they had libraries of people who donated books. And so you could just take books, take one, leave one. And that was really nice. But anyway, so that's my minimalist life for most of my life. And even now, the only reason I have furniture is because my wife insists that we have to have sit, sit and sleep on stuff. So the extreme version of what you're describing is someone like Jack Reacher, who is completely itinerant, has no possessions other than his toothbrush and he buys what he needs where he goes. I'm sure that's not realistic, but the point of it is the appeal of that lifestyle. A lot of people feel burdened after a point by their possessions. And that's ironic, isn't it? Because it's supposed to be something that we treasure. It's supposed to be something that we have spent time and money to acquire. 
what is it about a possession that makes it turn from being something that we value to something that feels burdensome to us? It's partly, if you come back to the property, the house itself, it's partly just the burden of maintaining that I now got to paint this thing and pay utilities and mow the lawn and deal with the tent caterpillars or whatever the issue is. Stuff comes with obligations. It either your car will fall apart and rust if it isn't maintained. You know, I'm sure you probably noticed it wasn't looking so great after two months in Australia when you came back to your car. And that's a simple example. So that's important to maybe just put a pin in and to say, hey, acquiring a possession does not end the discussion about that possession. That's just the very beginning. Some are easy. A book sits on a shelf, doesn't bother you so much. But anything bigger than that, a vehicle, anything with moving parts will need maintenance, start to wear down. And the more of them you have, the more parts of your life are devoted to just maintaining your stuff. And if you move, you got to move your stuff. And I think the more and more people acquire out of various reasons, and they would talk about why people acquire stuff, if that's interesting, but the more you acquire, the more it starts to feel burdensome. And probably a lot of people have felt a similar sense of relief. I know we did when getting rid of things and moving, like you have that initial resistance to overcome that emotional hurdle to say, oh, I liked this book so much when I bought it. Can I really just donate it or sell it or get rid of it now? Or worse, throw it out. Can I separate from it? And once you overcome that hurdle, uh, then it's a feeling of relief on lighter now. You are literally and figuratively lighter. I don't have to carry this with me in a box or a bag or a moving van. And I would say... As a society, we are still moving up the curve of the availability of material possessions. The West is several decades ahead of a bunch of the rest of the world. And you can actually measure society's progress and individuals' place in that society by the amount of stuff that they have. I saw an interesting photographic series once that a person went around the world and just asked people to take all the stuff out of one room in their house and put it outside the house in front. And then it took a picture of the people standing outside in the yard, the stuff out of that one room. And it was just fascinating country to country, what things people had, how many they had, it, it definitely says something about us. So I think in the West, we might already be at a point where we're moving backwards. We hit peak stuff and now we're starting to see less stuff, mainly because of the device, the phone, Kindle, where all of your books, all of your music, all of your DVDs or videos, you don't have to have them physically possess them anymore. That's freed up a lot of space. You're still spending the money to buy those things, but you just don't see it anymore. I don't know. What do you think? Have you, you're probably compared to most of us more in the accumulation phase because you're in a spot now. You got a bookshelf find you, Andy. That's a big step. Wow. I always, you know, the first thing I buy, even before bed sometimes, it was actually first thing is desk because I got to do my computer somewhere, especially now since that's how I make my money. But even back in the day, you know, I had to put, I would, I remember living in one apartment with a buddy of mine. And he had a nice room with a nice bed and a desk and like all the furniture in the house was his. And he's got your room. I was like, great. And then I threw my poncho liner, which is a camouflage kind of blanket that we use in the, when we go out in the woods and sleep, I threw it on the ground. I was like, that's where I slept for three years on the ground with my poncho liner. And eventually I did buy a, a desk for my computer. My first desktop is before laptops and to play Doom on. And, uh, and then all of my books were in boxes around my room and all my clothes. I had a clean clothes and a dirty clothes box and I didn't fold anything because most of it was t-shirts and socks and shorts and then a couple of pairs of jeans. So when I washed them, I threw them in the clean box and when they were dirty, I put them in the dirty box and I brought the dirty box down and cleaned it and I washed them. And that's kind of how my life went for three years while I lived there. And then when I left Italy. I even sold my car. I put my car back. Actually, I gave it to my son. I gave my car to my son. I said, I told my sons all my military gears in my dad's garage. If you want anything, if you're going to join the military or if you just want stuff, go get it. There's knives in there. There's machetes from Panama and Colombia. There's whatever. There's stuff. And there's stuff over there. Go get your stuff and put it in your own stuff house so you can have your own stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm passing my stuff on. And then I also divide all my books. Like I only want to keep these books because everything else I got on Kindle and these aren't available on Kindle. So if you want books, they're there too. If you want to take the books and sell them, you can sell them, whatever you want. And then I moved to Romania and I lived in Romania pretty much on two suitcases. And then when we moved to Spain, we started, like you said, acquiring furniture, which makes me go, nah, nah someone's going to move it. 
because we're still renting a house. We don't own the house. If we owned a house, it'd be different because that'd be, okay, we're setting down roots. But I'm like, someone's got to move the furniture. We can hire a person, but in Europe, it's not as easy to hire a person to do all the pieces. Someone's got to pack all this stuff up. Someone's got to, I, I don't look forward to that. No, I have the same reaction. I only slightly jokingly say to my wife every time we buy some, hey, that's just another item for a future garage sale or something we're going to have to throw out. And I, every time I start with that mindset of like, this thing's coming with strings attached. It's not just, oh, now I have this lovely painting or bowl or whatever it is. It, my God, I'm going to have to deal with that thing at some point. So Did far, you Randy, we and get rid of stuff though? Because you have, your kids are living in your house in Switzerland. So you pretty much left all your stuff there. And then you move some of the stuff to where you're living now, but did you even, have you even gotten rid of the stuff in the last three or four years or it's just moved around that spread out and then you fill it, refill it with more stuff? So we made our situation worse uh, and it's a de- uh, relative wealthy person's problem. We had vacation home and that we had to have separate plate burgers so we could just go there and have our stuff there. And then we had the house we were living in. And so we did try to consolidate sold that house. And then all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of stuff from that house that we had to deal with. Some of it left there, but a bunch of it got put into the one house. And so it was very full. And when we moved out to get, Hey, all your junk is in here. We can't put our own junk in. So we then just recently went back and did clean up in a couple of rounds, quite a bit of our things. I threw out and donated thousands and thousands, literally in each category, books, CDs, the VHS tapes and other things that we realized, Hey, we are using this, we're unlikely to use it if we can donate it or sell it fine. And it's not, if we are going to see our way parted with this. When we moved to the U S a little over two years ago, Randy, we made a conscious choice to bring nothing with us. We couldn't carry on our backs or in a suitcase. And so that meant a little bit of clothes, but otherwise it was a fresh start. Now, on the one hand, you could say a materialist and Amazon dream, because what did we do? We came and <laughs> bought new things, but less, a lot less than we otherwise would have if we had just moved a household stuff over. And I love the minimalist feel of it. Yeah, there's nothing in the house except just what we need. And only it's our fault if we put things in now that make us have that same feeling of too much stuff. So we're trying to have a mindful relationship with possessions. And then what happened? You know, I'm like, oh, I would like to have a bicycle. So you get a bicycle. Like, ooh, I'd like to have a motorcycle. I get a motorcycle. And it's like, yeah, it, 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 the process continues, but it's a little bit slower this time. Uh, what I wanted to add to the discussion, or maybe see if we could segue into Randy, was so far we've been talking about this on a fairly individual level and a fairly personal level. What is one's relationship and one's family's relationship with possessions and why? I see another factor as being a pretty big driver of people's behavior with possessions, and that is to friends and neighbors. Now, the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing, which you probably avoided by virtue of the settings you were in. But as soon as you're living in a neighborhood and you are in a house and you do see the same people every day, what do you see? You see the car that they're driving, you see the house that they're in, and you see these external displays of, it's not stuff so much as what that stuff signifies. Oh, I'm successful. I'm wealthy. I'm doing okay. And... That, I think that phenomenon is real. You don't have to play the game if you don't want, but I see a lot of people who appear to be consuming things and buying things for the purpose of putting on a display. Maybe it's for themselves just to feel good, but why I've made it. Uh, but I think part of it is some of the house sizes, right? The average house size in America apparently has doubled in the past 25 years from a little under 2,000 square feet to now more than 4,000 square feet. Yeah. And, I, you know, when we drive around and look at houses in different neighborhoods, some of them are just absolutely disproportionate norms. And I asked myself, why? By the way, more space means more opportunity to put stuff in. I got seven guest bedrooms. I guess they all need a bed and a closet and wow. So how do you feel about the relative display of wealth uh, or has that played a factor for you? Have you observed it or maybe less so? How do you do that even in the military? I got more medals on my shirt or there isn't really an opportunity. I think that my wives were worried about that more than me, to tell you the truth. I mean, I- I was never one of keeping up with the Joneses unless it was something that I was going to use, like a new computer or the Kindle or whatever. Never bothered me. And also the conversations went, oh, did you see when we went over there, did you see this? We should get one of those. It's like, we're just going to have to move it. I always looked at it with that thing in my mind. Because none of the places I ever stayed in the last 
50 years where my permanent, where I was going to end up. So I, every time, and I was like, my thing was, someone's going to have to move it. Someone's going to have to sell it. Someone's going to have to paint it before we sell it. So, and that someone's going to be me. And, and, say, and that's the way I looked at anything we did. I actually own a house in Florida that we lived in, but I knew I still had 10 years left in the military. So I knew we were going to move eventually. And so I'd come back from a nine month deployment and a wall would be painted. I'm like, why? Well, we wanted to make it look brighter. And I, I just felt like that. I felt like I want to do is like, who's going to paint it back? So I will. Sure you will. It's that didn't happen <laughs> or whatever. I, it, everything, every time I came, every time I came home, something was different. We had more stuff or something was a different color or something. I was like, we have to leave eventually. Why are we going to make it more difficult for us to leave? And of course, I understand their point of view is, but we're living here now and we should make it livable. And so there's a, ha there, is there a happy medium? I don't know. For me, it, all, it always like, okay, that's going to be more work. I got to put that on my list of things I got to do before I leave, which means I can't just, I can't be Jack Reacher. Okay. When I was single, also there's a famous quote from Heat, don't ever, don't ever, have anything that you can't walk out the door in 30 seconds and leave behind something like that. And so for the first 30 years of my life, I probably had that kind of life. And then in between my marriages, I probably had that life where I could throw my two bags of stuff in whatever vehicle I was driving and drive away and every, and the house burned down. I was fine with it. But, uh, but I, as I uh, acquire loved ones, they can't. So that that's life. I get it. Even within a family unit or a pair, I think what you're describing, Randy, raises a really interesting point, which is that individuals have very different feelings about and relationships with stuff. And so one partner might really be like you and not interested in gaining material possessions for the sake of it. And another one might be more interested in that. Of course, it relates to lots of factors, how you grew up, what your aspirations were. Um, important and useful to talk about it and just bring those sorts of thoughts and feelings out in the open. One of the ironies I observe in wealthy places is that people use their purchases of things as a proxy for something else they're trying to achieve. I'd like to be happy. And if I buy this thing, it makes me feel happy. Forgetting that it's a fleeting thing and that then they need to buy something else a week later to feel happy. Whereas if you could bring the discussion out in the open of what is it that I'm actually trying to achieve? And is this method that I'm using helpful to me or not? So in other words, we look at the, the thing that is a measure for what we're trying to achieve rather than looking at what we're trying to achieve more directly and asking if there's a better way to do it. And possessions really, really often fall into that category more than titles and jobs and power and even money. Money is a means to an end and people then use their money to acquire possessions thinking that it's going to make them happy. And for some people it does, but not nearly as much as people think it does, which is I find so interesting. So the other reason I had cause more here in the U.S. to think about people's relationship with stuff. I can think of two experiences, Randy. One, when we were thinking about moving to the U.S. probably 15, almost 20 years ago and did not ultimately choose. And then later when we did move to the U.S., the first one was we were looking at houses. We had a real estate agent showing us around Columbus, Ohio at the time to say, oh, here's nice neighborhoods. Here's houses you could buy if you do move over here. And my impression, our impression when we were looking at these houses was two things. One, I got there flimsily made paper and sticks compared to Swiss houses, which are made to last for a hundred oh, years. That's not the approach that we take in the U.S. to keep houses more affordable. Fine, I get that. But that wasn't the main thing. The main thing was, wow, these houses filled with stuff, toys and cars and basements. A few basements we went through, it felt like you had to wade through two or three feet of just debris of lights. And I was like, wow, do people have many, many I possessions. So wealthy societies, people have so much stuff. It was off-putting and I was like, Ugh, this whole thing. And then we don't often think about, unless you have pause to think about it, and maybe you have thought about it more, but this later time when we did actually move to the U.S., we've been walking around neighborhoods a lot. One thing that comes up here where we are in the South is estate sales. So someone has passed on usually and their family wants to sell the house or there is no family. And then there's a sign that comes up that says estate sale Saturday and you go and you see, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. You see a person's light in a voyeuristic way that you rarely get to see. You're wandering around, you're looking in their kitchen, you see their utensils, what they used every day. You're looking at the clothes in their closet. So you see their life. And one 
It's interesting what people collect over the course of their lives. And two, it's so sad how little it's worth to anyone else. Do you want someone else's used cup or used spoon or used clothes? You don't. And so you'll pay very little for them. And the rest of it ends up getting thrown in the trash or donated to Goodwill. It is incredibly boring to realize what a disparity there is between how much you value your things and how much anyone else in the world values that exact same pile of stuff. So that made me think, hey, wait a minute. This stuff that seems to have so much value to me actually is a large part of that is sentimental or just momentum. It's not objectively as valuable as you think it is. And maybe that's okay. Maybe it's fine. As long as you enjoy your stuff while you're alive, your bookshelf behind you is filled with books and they bring you joy. That's enough. But for me, somehow that was also a bit of a sobering realization to say, oh, what's going to happen to all your stuff after you die? And if it really is of little value, even now to your kids or your family, why worry about it? It seems like you have a healthy relationship with stuff in the sense that if you want it, take it. If you don't want it, I'm also fine with it. You've already made your peace with separating from a lot of your things. In other words, it sounds like to me, Randy, is that correct? My estate sale would be very disappointing. I mean, I wouldn't buy any new clothes if my wife didn't insist because I have my seven shirts and my seven pants that I wear all week that I'm happy and comfortable in my writing job at home. And, uh, and they also serve as my going out shopping with my wife, uh, they clothes. And so, but apparently you have to change with times or something. So we buy some new stuff and then they just, they get stuck in my closet and I just keep wearing the seven that I like until they fall off me. And then I have to get something new. But if I had my choice, I would buy the same seven shirts and the same seven pants that I like. And I would just wear the same ones every day. Yes. I use that as a criteria for how to make the separation from things easier when we move. I just say, all right, what have I actually been wearing the last two years? It ends up being similar to you, a handful of things, a small percentage of the potential total. And then I say, all right, I have not worn this. I might give myself a period of three months and say, hey, will, if I wear it in the next few months, I'll keep it. But if I don't, I knowing that I'm going to throw it out and still don't wear it, that's it. It goes in the donate pile. Yeah, I'll, I'll get some slack for this probably, but a uh, flack. But I mean, I get irritated after five or six days. I'm like, okay, where is my shirts and pants that I like to wear? They're not washed and they're washed because I didn't wash them. But in my defense, my wife doesn't like me to wash things. So I wait for her to wash them. And, and then when, and then I, and then I get to a point where either she's been gone for a couple of days or she's been sick or really busy. And so I'll have to ask for permission. I'm like, can I wash my stuff? She's like, yes, don't put any of my stuff with your stuff. I'm like, okay. Yeah. But I get antsy when I'm like, okay, I'm putting my last shirt on for the week that I like. And I like, and should you have a closet full of stuff? It's like, but this is the shirt, the last shirt that I like to wear. <laughs> what about the stuff I bought you for Christmas? It's like, I, it's thank you for buying that for me, but I like to wear these shirts. So here's something you said a minute ago that uh, triggered a thought in me, Randy, and that is the heat quote about don't have anything that you wouldn't be comfortable walking away from. I think actually, now that I hear it, it's a bit of an ex dream version of stoic philosophy, which is not to form attachments to things. And the reason for that is if we put our happiness in external things, then we lose control over some portion of our happiness because we don't have control over what happens to our things and to a certain extent. You could have a fire or a flood, or you could, and then if your happiness is tied to the ownership of the thing or the possession of the thing, then you put your happiness at risk. In other words, I realize I only now talking with you that I have, since we moved here to the U.S. and reacquired things, I've tried to keep a certain detach, sense of detachment in that I'm telling myself, if we had to leave the house and leave everything behind, I would be okay. Or, you know, that game people play about, oh, your house is on fire. You have 30 seconds to grab. What's important to you? What do you grab? By the way, interesting question, isn't it? What do you grab? Most people grab a photo book or something that has sentimental value, or I guess I shouldn't say that. I don't know what most people grab. I've heard that as one answer. I, I would go for my passport and maybe some ID documents that yeah. I would. My fanny pack has all my stuff. I grab it on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then tell my wife, let's go. Let's, why are we left yet? I got the dog. <laughs> what are we doing? And if you've got kids or pets, of course, take those. But so in other words, if one were to force the question, what do you really need? What do you really value? Those are two different questions. I know how small 
or how large would you define that list and why? And I accept, in the meantime, I also accept there's multiple good answers to questions like this because I know people are different and their circumstances are different and their lives are different. And I begrudge no one their accumulation of things uh, because they may have good reasons for doing it. I think it also depends on your, on what you need to live a reasonably comfortable life and rebuild your life. And if you have the monetary means to do that, I have enough money and savings. And plus I have my military income every month. If that went away, there'd be probably a different answer to this, but I can walk away from this house. If it's burning to the ground, I can walk away from this house. Everything can burn. I got my dogs, my wife, I got passports and I got my little freaking case, which has my visa card and whatever. And we can get in the car and drive away and we can start over. And it wouldn't be super pleasant, but we would be, we'd figure it out. We'd go stay in an Airbnb, then we'd go find a house, then we start restocking it slowly but surely. Within a year, we'd be exactly where we were before. I don't think everyone can do that. So it, A, it's a lot more traumatic, and B, they're going to start trying to save stuff that's either irreplaceable. Maybe they have more attachments to stuff if they've been there forever. I think a lot of our peers in the United States, they come from a city or a town and they go to high school there and they go to college and they get a job there and everything, they have stuff that's really meaningful for their family and stuff. I grew up in Iran. We lost all our stuff in Iran when we got evacuated out. We brought one suitcase of keys. So we started from scratch then when I was 10 years old. And so the oldest stuff that we have really is from 35, 40 years ago that my family has, unless we got it from our grandparents for some reason. So I don't have anything that's been in my family for hundreds of years, a gun or a, a knife that my, you know, grandfather used in the civil war or my great grandfather used in the civil war or something like that. I don't have anything like that. So I don't really have anything that I uh, think is as precious, but I think I can see where people have heirlooms, heirlooms, heirlooms. heirlooms yeah. Yeah. I can see where they have something that their father, their great, great grandfather brought over from Holland when they came over on them. Mayflower or whatever. And, and that's really special to the family. And maybe that's something that goes out the door with them. I don't have anything like that. So I can, like I said, I can probably be a heat guy. I can walk out in 30 seconds. I don't know if I could, I mean, my knees hurt. I don't know if I could get out the door in 30 seconds, but I could grab, I can grab, I know where exactly where two or three things are that I need to start over are. That's the most important thing for me to walk out the door with my loved ones and that. I think you're right. People's circumstances do differ. And for some people, the loss of their house and their possessions is, of course, for everyone, that's devastating, but some people can recover from that more quickly. We watched too many shows about where the paths of hurricanes and tornadoes go in the U.S. when we were trying to figure out where to live because my wife didn't want to be in a disaster prone area. We could avoid it. And yeah, those pictures of people who are standing in front of their house after a tornado has gone through, that's, they're justified quite upset, many of them. But to the extent that you are physically okay, there's always a way. People do make their way back to that. And we are, all of us, more than our possessions. And I would say no person is defined by their possessions. Uh, they might become a caricature of themselves by virtue of being so wealthy, they get listed as the wealthiest man in the world. But really, Elon Musk is not his wealth. Bill Gates is not his wealth. Those are just people who are wealthy. But that's, when you talk about family heirlooms and Having things that uh, might have passed down for generations, it raises another point I wanted to mention, Randy, which is what everyone can easily possess, no one values higher. So in other words, scarcity is one of the key drivers of value. When our grandparents are saving to start their home and a big portion of their income went to buying a nice bed or a nice piece of furniture, that's because it was super well-made and there weren't a lot of them and it was a big deal to be able to establish your household. Now you can go to Ikea and for a much relatively smaller amount of money and percentage of your income, you can get a closet or a bed and it wasn't expensive and you couldn't care less about it because anyone can have it and it just isn't that rare. So a little bit, there's that element of it as well. You don't value stuff as much when it's a commodity and things become heirlooms by virtue of their objective value. Oh, that's a really super nice made thing or because of its sentimental value, has memories myself of growing up and seeing this thing, or it's been in the family for X generations. And therefore, just by virtue of having survived the ravages of time for that long, it takes on a certain value. 
I suspect fewer and fewer things are attaining heirloom status just because they weren't that great to begin with. Anyone can have one and people don't hold on to their stuff as well. The types of things that are likely to become heirlooms today, I mean, it's probably even the wrong word. I try to think what sort of stuff that would be. It could still be a piece of furniture, could be a car that your dad or granddad had. What would you put in that category? Bruce Willis's watch that he stuck up his butt in Pulp Fiction. No, that's your Pulp Fiction. In Pulp Fiction. Remember? Oh, okay. Pulp Fiction. He had this watch that his grandfather smuggled out of, of World War II. All right. Yes. A watch could fall in that category. So me, I think it'd be jewelry would probably be the biggest thing now that people inherit. You know, that is worth something. It's worth something to them because of monetarily, but it's also worth something because of their family history. Uh, this is grandpa's engagement ring and now you can use it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Uh, my parents have some really good art that they've acquired over the years. It's worth some money, but it's also something I grew up with and I really liked it. So that's something I would probably still hang on my wall if I inherited it or something like that. So and it's not Picasso or anything, but it's something I liked. And it reminds me of my youth. I think there's every reason to try and cultivate a healthy relationship with possessions. So if we talk about, you know, the theme of our podcast and passionately wrong, it's hard to be too critical. The thing that I would highlight, which I've already mentioned, where I see what seems to me uh, as an outsider, like a mistake is placing too much of our happiness in the assumption that buying stuff will make us happy. And then that also implies that if I don't get what I want, I'm going to be unhappy. So I, from a stoic perspective, I find that to be an unnecessary buying of happiness with stuff that I seems to me make people actually more unhappy than it makes them happy. So that's one area where I would say is people are listening to this, trying to figure out what it all means. Think about that. Think about your own relationship with stuff and how you are using it to either live your life or achieve happiness or whatever it is the purpose of those things serve. But be willing to question whether it's serving its intended purpose. And if not, you can change your relationship with stuff. Randy and I are probably at an extreme end and Randy much more so than me in terms of living in a way that isn't tied specifically to stuff and seems to be working just fine um, so far. Any other thoughts, Randy, that you have as we wind this down about our passionately wrong thing or otherwise I hesitate to say we're giving advice to people on this because I don't think we are. No, but I think it'd be, it's something to consider if we're going to talk about passionately wrong, what can you live about, live without and what you have to walk out of the house with. It's not a bad thing to think about. And make sure whatever you have to walk out to start a new life, if everything's going downhill, whether it's an earthquake or a, a storm or a fire, then you know where all that stuff is. Or And you can tell someone where it is if you're not in town and they're, they're having to leave without you. Just really minimizing that, figuring out what's the most important things that people can walk out and put in their car and leave. Because uh, I think, I don't think... I hope that the people that are in those disaster areas think about that stuff, but I'm not sure they do. And the thing is, disaster could happen anywhere. A fire could happen anywhere, unfortunately. A lightning strike or whatever. You know, you left the gas on, whatever's going on. And just being able to not risk everybody's life and still walk out the door with what you need at a minimum and know where everything is. You forgot to add to your list of things that you would be able to restart your life with, Randy, the fact that the Passionately Wrong Pet podcast is online. And so you never need to be far away from being able to contribute a new episode or access old episodes. And actually, all joking aside, the fact that a great deal of our lives are online now is creepy and weird from a privacy perspective, but also uh, creates a certain resilience that we didn't have before. If all of your work was in writing and the room goes up in flames, well, there it goes. But now it's all online and therefore you really haven't lost anything other than the short-term access to your, your work. So in some ways, we've become more resilient uh, in the face of all this stuff that we have, at least if you think about it and can set yourself up a little bit. So in addition to the physical things that one would take with them in the event of a disaster, giving some thought to the electronic access, how am I going to get access to my bank accounts and make sure that the mortgage still gets paid? And hopefully some of that's automated, but that would be part of a relationship with one's things and prudent risk management that I would say, if you're in a disaster prone area, also think about. Yeah. No. That's a good idea. No, I can, I, if my computer died right now or someone took my computer or it burned or whatever, I, all my stuff's backed up online. Just get another computer, sign in. I don't even have to remember my password. I, I get something sent to my email. 
So it's super, super easy. All right. And maybe we shall just, this is just an experiment just occurred to me. If you had to pick uh, what are two or three of your favorite things physically, Randy, not people, of course, and relationships, but I'm talking about physical things. What would you, what would come to mind? My uh, secret password book. And I don't mind me of uh, Back to the Future now with Marty and this fighting over the, the fucking sports results for the last 50 years. So my, I think it, my Kindle, my phone, those are the, those, that, there's going to be a lot of waiting around while you're trying to rebuild your life. So the Kindle, the phone, and then charging devices. That's the three things that I would throw in my backpack as I walked out the door. Those have great practical utility, and it's really hard to argue with the one or two electronic devices that you use frequently. There's a ton that you can do with them. So they'd have to give you that one in terms of what do you actually need to have. I'm asking you a different question, and maybe it's the same question. I don't what have. do you treasure? What do you treasure? I treasure my books on my Kindle, and I treasure my okay. photos alone. <laughs> no, 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 I, I don't have any photos. I don't, I'm looking around the room. I don't have anything that I would have a problem leaving behind. I don't, I don't have any attachments to anything that is in this house. And I don't think I have any attachments to anything that I stored in my parents' house either because I haven't lived without it for a couple of years. I can't think of anything. What about you? In what you just I said, watch, you know, the watch that you, that someone carried out of World War II in their butt. I do not. I went through a small phase of in trying to dress professionally and well for work purposes to thinking that I needed also a fancy watch and I bought a couple until I realized, oh, this is stupid. There's no end of not posturing, but comparisons that one could make. And I don't want to get into that game. So I stopped. I've been wearing only a sports watch for many years and it's functional. No watch, exactly. Because you got a phone watch. I, of course, you know, in terms of what I would take as I leave the house, it's what we already talked about, your identification documents, your phone, stuff like that. I also do genuinely appreciate it's probably because of you know, my mom having run a shop that sold handmade goods and then living in countries where handmade things was a way to really stand out what anyone can buy a piece of furniture from ikea what makes a piece of furniture special well if someone had handmade that piece of furniture today and he carved it a it's going to be immensely expensive and b if you get a good one it's going to be well made so i have a, an appreciation for beautiful well-made functional things, something that someone who is a real artist and good at their craft spent time on. So I just turned around to get, this is a very simple example, but a little hand made nice by a guy named William Henry. It's beautifully forged and crafted. It has little gemstones in it. This I, it has no use whatsoever. I'm going to cut a piece of salami with this, <laughs> with a $1 nice instead of a thousand dollar nice. But I appreciate this because it is handmade well-made and unique in that respect. It is, there's no other one like this in the world. And I can appreciate that. It's a little bit the scarcity point that I said to you before, but also it's the artistry that goes into making. I have a few things like that, a handmade Russian box, for example. Uh, those are the only two I can think of, but a, a nice knife or a nice little piece of artwork that I would say, this is a treasured possession. And those would be some of the very few things that I would carry with me from place to place. Because they're small enough, I can stick that in a bag and I don't have to cart it around. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I just buy a new knife. I, I understand what you're saying. I just don't have anything like that in my life. But speaking of knives, and Gail, who, who is going to be on a future or a past episode or a future episode, I remember when she left Columbia, she did a really good job at her job. And one of the organizations that she was, the military organization she was supporting was so appreciative. They gave her a ninja green beret knife uh, as a going away present, which I have a bunch of knives, none of them have sentimental value, but I have a bunch of knives. I bought over time, the army's issued me knives over time and I got to keep them because once you use them and whatever you end up doing with it, the army doesn't want you to have it back. And so it never, to me, I don't know, I guess if someone gave me a knife, I'd like, oh, thanks. That's cool. But she was like blown over when she got this knife. She's oh my God, I got, this is awesome. This is the best present I've ever gotten. I, I never really thought about normal people getting knives, but I, that stuck in my brain ever since that happened. That was in 2007 or 2008. And so I've been giving, for people I really appreciate in, who are not in my world, my knife world, I would give knives away. I would buy a knife that was like a symbolic from the 
back in the World War II when the S for the OSS would use this special knife and I would buy that and I would tell them about the historical symbol and symb symbolicness of it. And I would give them the knife and most of them were like super, this is the best gift ever, a knife, cool. And so I never realized the effect that would have on normal civilians. Yeah, it's a good place for us to bring this one to an end. And hopefully it's been somewhat interesting for readers as we meandered our way through. Possessions have a symbolism, Randy, and it can be a deep personal meaning. It can be related to the functional value. The combination, however, of an object that has functionality, potentiality, a knife is a very potent thing because it's dangerous, it's functional. But what makes it special in the circumstances you're describing is also then the human emotion behind it. It's a, I am recognizing something in you and I'm giving it to you in recognition of it. It's a, well, that's what a lot of our favorite possessions do is they call up both the memory of the time and of the people that we spent time together with. And so that's for me, one of the best uses of a possession or the best functions of a possession that it does something for you. And even if it does nothing any more practical for you, it reminds you of your connections with other people. And those are not possessions as such, but it's some of the things that people would value most highly more than I value any uh, item in my house. Of course, I had to exclude people from my challenge to you because you would immediately say, of course, my relationship with my wife and my kids is more important than any stuff. And that's uh, uh, maybe how we'll end it that, hey, of course, it is the human connections that are important. Don't get distracted too much by stuff. Have a healthy relationship with your things. And thank you for listening. We appreciate your time, which is also a kind of possession or a commodity that we don't take for granted. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'll talk to you next time. Fine. We'd love to hear what you think. So please comment on the show with your thoughts. We read all of your comments. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for subscribing. See you next time.